This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, a national day of mourning has been declared following the death of former President George H.W. Bush, who died Friday at the age of 94. The post office and other federal agencies are closed for the day. A funeral service for Bush is being held today at the Washington National Cathedral. Former presidents Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, Jimmy Carter and Bush's son, George W. Bush, will attend, as will President Trump, who was not invited to speak. Former Florida Governor Jeb Bush explained why President Trump was not speaking by saying, quote, it's because we have a unique circumstance here. My brother was president, first dibs, as we used to say. Uh, a second funeral will be held on Thursday in Houston, where jo uh, George H.W. Bush will be buried. Uh, well, we continue now to look back at the legacy of the 41st president. Bush only served one term uh, in the Oval Office, but the blowback from his 1991 invasion of Iraq is still being felt today. Although the Gulf War technically ended in February 1991, the U.S. war on Iraq would continue for decades, first in the form of devastating sanctions and then in the 2003 invasion launched by uh, George H.W. Bush's son, uh, George W. Bush. Thousands of U.S. troops and contractors remain in Iraq today. We look back now at a largely forgotten aspect of Bush's war on Iraq, the vast domestic propaganda campaign that occurred in the United States before the invasion began. The story centers on a young Kuwaiti woman named Nayira. On October 10, 1990, the 15-year-old girl gave riveting testimony before Congress about the horrors inside Kuwait after Iraq invaded. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, my name is Nayira, and I just came out of Kuwait. My sister, with my five-day-old nephew, traveled across the desert to safety. There is no milk available for the baby in Kuwait. They barely escaped when their car was stuck in the desert, desert sand, and help came from Saudi Arabia. I stayed behind and wanted to do something for my country. The second week after the invasion, I volunteered, volunteered at the al Adan Hospital with 12 other women who wanted to help as well. I was the youngest volunteer. The other women were from 20 to 30 years old. While I was there, I saw the Iraqi soldiers come into the hospital with guns. They took the babies out of the incubators, took the incubators and left the children to die on the cold floor. It was horrifying. I could not help but think of my nephew. Nayira's testimony was rebroadcast across the country and marked a turning point in public opinion on going to war. President George H.W. Bush repeatedly cited her claims. And they had kids in incubators, and they were thrown out of the incubators so that Kuwait could be systematically dismantled. Three months after Nayira testified, President George H.W. Bush launched the invasion of Iraq. But it turned out Nayira's claims weren't true. No human rights group or news outlet could confirm what she said. It also turned out Nayira was not just any Kuwaiti teenager. She was the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador to the United States, Saad Nasir al-Sabah. She had been coached by the public relations firm Hill & Knowlton, which was working for the Kuwaiti government. We're joined now by the journalist who first revealed Nayira's identity. Rick MacArthur, the president and publisher of Harper's Magazine, the author of the book Second Front, Censorship and Propaganda in the 1991 Gulf War. I mean, so, you know, as we said, this is, is a turning point. You have this teenager, this girl saying she witnessed this, um, that Iraqi soldiers came into Kuwait and ripped babies out of Kuwaiti incubators. But she was only referred to as Nayira at the time of the testimony. It wasn't Nayira al-Sabah, so you would know that she is the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador, who also testified in that hearing. <laughs> Correct. Uh, that's all part of the propaganda uh, plan, is to 
maintain her anonymity uh, to protect her, her and her family against repri reprisals in Kuwait. That, that was the cover story. But, of course, nobody bothered to try to find out who she really was. They just bought the story hook, line and sinker, even though at the time there were a couple of human rights investigators who were becoming suspicious. Uh, I got onto the trail after the war, unfortunately, uh, and was able to run down what really had happened, which was that Hill and Knowlton selected her uh, as a persuasive witness to this atrocity, and um, it was all part of a campaign to turn Saddam Hussein, at least in the public uh, uh, consciousness, into Adolf Hitler. And the, the feeling was that they couldn't sell the Gulf War without this. In other words, they had to cheat to win. And that's what interests me about the uh, eulogies for George Bush. Uh, he's being presented now as this paragon of kind of WASP respectability and integrity, old school, when in fact uh, uh, he was a, had a violent side to him, a very uh, angry and violent and uh, uh, ruthless side to him. And when you see him doing the propaganda, using the Hill and Knowlton uh, disinformation, you see a side, a side of a politician that's kind of ugly. And we're still, as Juan said, we're still living with the consequences of our having placed troops in Saudi Arabia, because that's what sets off bin Laden, finally. Uh, and, Rick, in terms of uh, most people, uh, it's been over a quarter century now, most people don't recall the climate then, but there was a, a there was significant public opposition to the United States going uh, uh, into uh, into Iraq to beat back the invasion of Kuwait and uh, and the vote to approve uh, the military action was very close, wasn't Pre it? So this was crucial, uh, this kind of this testimony. Precisely. You got to remember, in 1990, 91, we're only, what, 15 years after Vietnam, and there's still this uh, very, very bad feeling in the country uh, that's uh, represented in Congress by senators like John Kerry that we were conned into Vietnam. It was an undeclared war, and we weren't going to get conned again into another f uh, a phony war or a, a, pre a phony pretext. And so it was clear that Bush was going to have to get congressional authorization for invading, for liberating Kuwait. And so uh, the, clo the vote was going to be very close. Uh, it ended up being 52 to 47. It would have been 52 to 48 if Alan Cranston, uh, the senator from California, had come back to Washington to vote. He said he would have voted if it was close. Uh, he was undergoing chemotherapy in California. And it's clear that does, I mean, numerous uh, representatives and senators cited the baby incubator atrocity, which was false. It never happened. Uh, as a reason for voting for the Gulf War resolution. In other words, these are people who said, well, look, we, we could figure out other ways to get Saddam Hussein out of uh, Kuwait. Economic sanctions, negotiations. Uh, there was a feeling that this was about oil. Uh, it wasn't about principle, even though Bush posed it as a, a matter of international law. Uh, but these people said, finally, look, if he's really Hitler, if he's really capable of having an army that slaughters. And it, came, it got to hundreds of babies by the time Amnesty International gave its official seal of approval to the, uh, to the story. Now, that's... Uh, yeah, and I it, recall it was inflated. It, that's it very, very important yeah. about and, Amnesty International right. and the role that it played. It wasn't just Naira. It wasn't just Naira. Human Rights Watch fell for it. Uh, they were neutral officially. But uh, Amnesty International actually put the number over 300 babies. There weren't that many incubators in Kuwait City hospitals. Now, if you want to go back over the record, you'll see how, how badly the, the media, how badly the press failed in all this. Well, I remember the, the, my newspaper, the New York Daily News, had a front page. They, they killed the babies. Yeah, you know, and yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, so the media uncritically accepted this story without sure. any kind of check. And if he's a baby killer, then, well, you know, reasonable people can disagree about how to enforce international law, how to prevent countries from invading other countries. But we have to draw the line at baby killing. And, and after the war, it's not just me. It's John Martin uh, who did the, the really good reporting. He went around to for all ABC. the hospitals for ABC News and did what a reporter should do, unfortunately too late, interviewed hospital personnel, doctors, did a very thorough job. Nobody could cite 
one instance of a baby being pulled from an incubator by uh, Iraqi soldiers and killed. Uh, there were babies killed because of neglect and because of the American bombardment uh, uh, of Kuwait and of Iraq, uh, because a lot of hospital personnel fled. There were casualties. There were infants uh, who died. But there were no uh, babies killed by being pulled from incubators. It never happened. And this was, uh, I think, as you note, the beginning of a, a new effort at the—or the, uh, an inc uh, increased effort at pro the propaganda campaigns of, of our government to justify war. Right. And this is something that hasn't been explored enough. Again, we go back to George Bush's uh, alleged uh, WASP uh, integrity and respectability. Well, he's also the father of, of uh, George W. Bush, who took the propaganda, cam uh, propaganda campaign a couple of steps further with uh, Saddam's fake atomic bomb program. Never happened. Never existed. Uh, in the time that we said it was going on. Uh, he may have had ambitions before, but it, there certainly was no atomic bomb program in uh, 2002, 2003. Uh, but uh, we've now gotten so used to uh, debating uh, whether we should go to war or not based on fake news. I'm sorry to quote Donald Trump, but false information, uh, that we don't know how to discuss these uh, subjects anymore. And the war-making power has been taken out of the hands of the people, almost been taken out of the hands of the Congress. Uh, it's almost quite... Somebody said to me earlier, why did Bush bother to ask Congress for permission to invade Iraq in, in 1991? Uh, well, back then, we were still uh, a little bit more of a constitutionally uh, ruled country. And there was this bitter memory of the Gulf of Tonkin resolution and Vietnam and uh, the fact that we fought an undeclared war uh, on, on false pretexts. We're talking to Rick MacArthur, uh, publisher of Harper's Magazine, author of Second Front, Censorship and Propaganda in the Gulf War. The beginning of your book, uh, Second Front, Censorship and Propaganda in the 1991 Gulf War, is the first chapter is called Cutting the Deal. And you start with a quote of um, uh, Earl Shore is saying, some men are pleased to give orders, some men are pleased to take orders. It's really the beginning of the embedding process. Right. And explain this highly unusual meeting, August morning in 1990, eight days after Iraqi forces invaded Kuwait. Of the four at the time, and, you know, the media landscape is so different, the four Washington bureau chiefs of the major U.S. television networks Presenting themselves where? Well, they present themselves at the home of Prince Bandar, uh, who is the Saudi a fixer in the United States. He's the sort of major domo of everything that happens Saudi-related in the United States. And he's, he's, uh, he's the guy that the reporters have to ask for favors. To, that's who you, you, you go to for help. Because the White House and the Pentagon had decided from the beginning, we're not going to have another Vietnam. In other words, we're not going to have another situation where reporters are permitted to go anywhere they want, take pictures of corpses, take pictures of uh, burning buildings or helicopters crashing. Uh, we're not going to, because this, the, the, the belief was, uh, the revisionist belief was that we lost Vietnam because the American public was demoralized by all the bad news coming back on CBS Evening News and in Newsweek. So we're not going to let this happen again. And the decision was made to pool reporters and to censure them. In other words, you'd send groups of five to the front, uh, wherever the, the Pentagon decided the front happened to be that day. Uh, they would get to take pictures and describe things in theory, but their uh, report would have to be shared with everybody else. There'd be no competition, and it would have to be vetted by Pentagon censors. So obviously, um, the American public saw nothing. <laughs> the reporters were permitted to see nothing, and it was a, a, a kind of comical, finally, uh, to see hundreds of reporters in Dharan, uh, which is where the press center was, recycling uh, censored reports from the front, which showed nothing. There were two or three honorable reporters, Chris Hedges, uh, uh, Bob Simon of CBS, uh, who went, who went uh, off, off the reservation, so to speak, and saw a little bit. 
uh, but these were the exceptions. Susan Sachs from Newsday was another person who tried but to do a good didn't job. Didn't they go to the Saudi ambassador's home, sent there by the Bush administration, even though the Bush administration was sending soldiers um, into Saudi Arabia? Uh, when it came to the press getting permission, right. they said, you'll have to get permission from Saudi Arabia. Well, this was a way to lobby the Saudis for favors. It was still going to be the Pentagon that decided who got to go where when. But the feeling was among the network was if, you, if we can get Prince Bandar to cut us some, uh, give us some, fa do, do some favors for us, cut us some slack, maybe he can use his influence with the Bush administration to give us better access than the competition. Uh, and this brings us back to the present day. I mean, we're in bed with the Saudi Arabians going back a long way. And the, the idea of the American media begging for favors from a Saudi prince well, it's it's an ugly it's an ugly uh, image, and it also speaks to the the hypocrisy of the American media back then and still today about the First Amendment. I mean, there were a group of us that sued the Pentagon, uh, Sidney Shanberg and the Nation and Harper's Magazine. We sued the Pentagon over this. We lost um, and over the censorship plan, but for the most part. Catherine Graham, Salzberger, uh, uh, the heads of the networks, they didn't do anything. That's all in my book also. You can see the, you can see what they said about it. We're talking to Rick MacArthur, publisher of Harper's Magazine, author of Second Front, Censorship and Propaganda in the Gulf War. We'll be back with him in a minute.